My name is Jessica Blossberg. I work with Minnesota Agriculture in the classroom as the Central Area Twin Cities Regional Curriculum Specialist. So I work with teachers and community leaders across the area to help find resources for them to bring agriculture into their classroom. I'll tell you more about the organization later, but I'm gonna bounce it to our next presenter, Mary, next. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Bichetti and I am the Minnesota Youth Institute coordinator um, located on the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. Thanks for being here. And Eric. Muted, dear. So in case there are some delays, Eric has had a snowstorm in his area today. Um, so Mary and I will be doing a bit of the talking and Eric will be monitoring the chat box for most of the meeting. Oh, Mary, Eric, I think we can hear you now. Try again. Okay, we'll try this as best as we can, yeah. So uh, Eric Swatsky, I teach at West Central Area High School and uh, I've had a few students who have done the Minnesota Youth Institute in the past, uh, but this year I'm working with a group of educators across the country and a group called Global Guides that I'll explain a little later on. All right, thank you. So my background um, is not just with agriculture in the classroom, that's actually the shorter piece of my life. The longer bit is I've been involved with World Food Prize programs since 2011, um, large part and thanks to Mary. Um, I was a student in the programs. I went through two of their internships. One was in Beijing, China, working at the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences for two months doing poultry research. Scared the late 18 year old working with master's degree students. Um, and I learned a lot in those two months about science and a culture that's completely different from my own. Um, it excited me so much to do that, that when I was student teaching, I actually brought this program and the idea of global awareness about food security to my student teaching classroom. And since then that school has continued to have this program there, um, having students write a paper to focus on different global issues surrounding hunger in different countries around the world and continuing to share ideas about how we can combat hunger issues. The Minnesota Agriculture in the Classroom organization has a goal of increasing agricultural liter literacy through K through 12 education. And that's not just for teachers in agricultural education. Um, some of you on the call might not be an agriculture teacher. Maybe you're an English teacher, a science teacher, math, social studies, and so on. All of those subjects can have agriculture integrated into the classroom in some way, shape, or form. We all need to eat. We all have ways of socializing with, e socializing with each other and sharing ideas to make everything we do a little bit better. Um, sharing our innovations with one another, and that can be involved with agriculture, as well as the things that we do with products from the natural world, be it food, fuel, fiber, and so on. Um, we do provide free resources in the form of lesson plans, as well as other resources to teachers in all those departments, and then some, and they do meet K through 12 academic standards. So you don't have to worry about not hitting your standards that you need to for the year. We do help you with that, and we have those listed for each lesson. Grants are also available through Minnesota Agriculture in the Classroom for teachers that apply and qualify. And we also have outreach and professional development opportunities available across the state, both in a virtual format, as well as if your school will allow it and we can work together on it, um, we can have some in person occasionally as well. Obviously more once COVID blows past a little bit better. I'll pass it to Mary to tell you a bit about World Food Prize and some of the programming and what it is. Um, so if you have uh, access to your reactions, I would love for you to give me a thumbs up or raise your hand if you have heard of Norman Borlaug or know who Norman Borlaug is. All right, I see most of you. Okay. Yes, I am so happy. Norman Borlaug grew up in northeastern Iowa. He was the son of Norwegian immigrants. And he was, I don't know if you know, he was going to go to teacher's college in Iowa, but a random friend of his uh, was coming to the University of Minnesota and dragged Norman to the U of M where he ended up getting a forestry and uh, bachelor's degree and a master and PhD in plant pathology. And 
went on to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his work and is known as the father of um, the Green Revolution. I'm really fortunate that he uh, came back to campus, so the Twin Cities campus several times, uh, including the 100th anniversary of the plant pathology department and had a chance to meet him. Um, one of the things that's been said about Norman Borlaug is that he, uh, well, he, the, he was disappointed. His greatest disappointment was that he could not convince the Nobel committee to create a prize for food or agriculture. So you know what? He just made his own. So together with uh, John Ruin from Iowa, they created the World Food Prize, which recognizes and rewards individuals who make an effort to um, increase access to food, uh, reducing food insecurity. It, the award is, rec is presented every year in October in Des Moines, Iowa, in conjunction or near the date of World Food Day, which is October 16th. And um, the World Food Prize is a, the Borlaug Dialogue that's hosted by the World Food Prize Foundation is an amazing event if you haven't been there before. Uh, Jess was Jessica was one of the one of many brave students that would walk up to a president of a country or a minister or whoever and chat with them and get their business card and follow up with them. And so it's it's just amazing, an amazing opportunity for everyone who attends. Um, so one of the things that Norman Borlaug was known for when he came back to campus, in addition to being a U of M wrestler and wanting to visit with the wrestling coach, who do you think he wanted to talk to? All the faculty wanted to visit with him, but he wanted to talk with the students. He wanted to know what the bright young minds were thinking about. So to that end, he created the Youth Institute in Iowa. And today there are uh, 27 youth institutes across the country and around the world that give students an opportunity to explore food security. Just if you wanna hit the next slide. So the um, the Youth Interest Institutes offer students in high school grades 9 through 12 the opportunity to dig a little bit deeper into solving problems around food security. They identify a topic, um, identify, choose a country, identify a topic, and then research and write a three to five page paper with a, their proposed solution to this problem. The students then will submit that paper in advance. Uh, go to campus, and I'm going to just share our example at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities because, as you'll see, the title of this slide is Youth Institutes in Minnesota. Since the Youth Institute, the Minnesota Youth Institute was uh, created, we've actually added three in the state of Minnesota, and I will speak to that in just a minute. But students turn in their paper, they come to campus, and there's kind of three components to the event. First is a, a welcome and a general context setting session. Then they break into small roundtable group discussions where there'll be five to six students together with two to three professionals, experts. All of you would qualify as experts. You know something about agriculture, you eat food, you care about food security. We would love to have you and I can speak, I believe for the other youth institutes in Minnesota would love to, uh, well, actually teachers, we want you to bring students. I'm looking at the uh, the Minnesota Ag in the Classroom staff. You should come be our experts. Anne-Marie, you're right there in my uh, the corner of my screen. Um, experts will interact with the students and ask them to think about how they might improve um, their proposed solution and, and uh, supportively challenge them in their, their, their uh, research. And then onto the next slide, uh, the students who participate have the opportunity where they will qualify for a thousand dollar scholarship um, either at CFANS at the U of M Twin Cities or the other three campuses that host a youth institute. One of the things that we have really tried to emphasize is regardless if you move on beyond this competition, the experience that a student gains is fantastic and I'm sure that Eric will speak to that. In addition, students also have the opportunity to um, a, a su subgroup go on to the Global Youth Institute like Jessica shared and meet with up to 250 other young adults from around the country and around the world. And then they also have the opportunity to apply for internships, uh, scholarships and fellowships. The one I like to highlight is the Borlaug Ruan internship where students can do research for eight weeks, all expenses paid in a country around the world for writing a three to five page paper. Um, 
I guess I did mention a little bit about the process onto the next slide. Uh, there are a couple basic steps. You choose a country, research a typical family, and then select a, a topic. A lot of students, it's been interesting, this last couple of years have been around water, water access, water cleanliness, water scarcity, um, a lot of environmentally focused issues. Uh, they analyze that impact of that challenge on food security and then propose solutions. Um, write the paper and attend the Youth Institute. Um, I was meeting earlier this week with a couple of alumni from the Youth Institute. And you know what was really inspiring for me is as adults, when we're working with the students, it makes you feel hopeful for the future because wow, they're amazing with the ideas they come up with. One of the students said that he was hopeful about the future because of what his peers had come up with for solutions. So it's a tremendous opportunity. Just jumping in with my own paper topic, I wrote my paper a little over 10 years ago um, and I was talking about managing water scarcity and adapting water and adapting farming practices in Kuwait. I didn't know where Kuwait was before I started writing that paper. Um, I really just ran my finger up and down the page and said stop and that's the one that my finger landed on and I've learned how to make it work. Um, but water scarcity has been an issue for a very long time. It's only getting worse so it definitely makes sense that many students are starting to write more and more about this topic. Now I'll test back to you. Yeah, these are different resources from Minnesota Ag in the Classroom. Um, I'm curious if everyone can pop it into the chat if you have a favorite lesson plan you've used, favorite resource you've used from us, or if you haven't used any of our resources or haven't even heard of them before, that's great to know too. Um, I pulled five of the lessons that I think would be most helpful if you would like to bring lessons about global food insecurity and global trade, global agriculture into your classroom. Um, these got the examples here. There's filling the global grocery bag, global food security, global trade and interdependence. That one's pretty interesting because you can also bring a game into it. I listed down at the bottom with the trading around the world. Um, that could be a couple days of lessons for you. And it's all right there on the website. You don't have to think of a thing. You just have to look at the lesson plan and go, oh, those are the materials. I know how to teach this. I got it. Um, I included the carbon cycle and climate smart agriculture because those are very hot topics right now, as well as things that the next generation is going to be faced with every day, whether they're working directly in agriculture or in a supporting industry or supporting um, area of work. The role of women in agriculture is an interesting topic as well, because even in the United States, that's fairly progressive in a lot of ways and having equality between men and women, there are still many countries that are ahead of us and many countries that are behind us when it comes to equality between men and women, especially when it comes to agriculture. Um, in most of the world, you hear about this all the time at the Global Youth Institute, the World Food Prize Symposium, and anybody you talk with in agriculture, that small farmers in developing countries are quite often women and they're not paid very well, or if they are men, they're still not paid very well. Um, but if we start to get women more involved in agriculture, you start to see the overall success of that country rise. So just one little area with these small farmers in that country can help the entire country have more success because the women are being more successful um, rather than being oppressed like maybe they have for many generations because the men are doing all the work and they're just taking care of the kids. Journey 2050. I personally love to play just for fun. Um, I learned about this game a few years ago. It is a resource that is linked on our Minnesota Ag in the Classroom website. And it is an interactive computer activity. You can have some lesson plans around it from Ag in the Classroom. Um, you could come up with your, some of your own ideas as well to incorporate it into your lessons. But it's a really fun way for students to go through a simulation of what it's like to be a farmer in a developing country in a certain situation. You have to make decisions along the way, see what the consequences are, are of those decisions. Um, and this whole game does align with educational standards as well, because the students are learning as well as playing a game. Um, the hunger map that I included here is from 2020, so not too old. And it shows where people were undernourished as a percentage of the total population across the world just two years ago. 
obviously the numbers are probably going to be a little bit different in 2022, but not terribly. Um, and you can see different trends as you see different versions of this map over the years. Uh, but this is one example of, an, of a resource you can find that isn't just a lesson plan within the curriculum matrix, which is a fun name for our library of lesson plans you can find in the resources area at our website. And I will jump it to Eric. I just want to read the chat quick to see what people said about their relationship with Ag in the Classroom. Seeing Journey 2050, Sarah said she likes that, yes. Um, Maria said she wants to add Journey 2050 more. I think that's a great idea. It, it really is fun. You should hop on and try playing it for yourself a little bit. Another hunger map to check out. Thank you for that. And Ethan, thank you for throwing in the grand challenge. Ooh, I like that. So lots of good ideas in the chat. Definitely read about what each other put in there. Continue to throw those ideas around. Um, obviously we're talking, but you guys can keep throwing some ideas out there as well and keep sharing those. So Eric, if you can talk about your teacher experience with the Youth Institute, I had one year of it, but I know you've had a couple more. So what do you think? Sure, so <clears throat> I'm gonna keep my camera off, open this uh, little all the uh, internet connection stays stable enough to get through this. Uh, but uh, so I taught uh, at a different high school for seven years where we actually had a global agriculture class that we taught, um, had a lot of really fun things that we did in that class. And, and this was obviously kind of the cornerstone of that. And because of that class, I had a number of students do the Minnesota Youth Institute, uh, specifically the one at the, the actual, we call Minnesota Youth Institute, which is at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And uh, a couple of those students were selected to go on to the Global Youth Institute down in Iowa. So I'll kind of cover the those as we go through this. Um, and then I know Ethan had asked about, you know, how do you scaffold? I might be able to talk about a little bit of what I do and, and how it kind of has worked or maybe didn't work or um, some there's successes and failures in all of these different lessons as we all know. So um, first and foremost, uh, especially you know, not just in the ag teaching world, but especially in the other parts of the educational realm, this is a great first opportunity to integrate agricultural lessons into, into classes. And uh, I always go to the old standard of the, the Minnesota Ag in the Classroom uh, geography lessons that they have that teach you about why commodities are grown in certain areas, you know, why, why is uh, corn or soybeans or sugar beets grown where it is and how is that related to geography? And we can just open those doors to these students. Um, a suggestion, I don't know where everybody's teaching background is or what else you're thinking of as connections in your school, but um, do something directly with your English teachers because this is uh, obviously a paper-based project and so it's a great opportunity for your English teachers to experience topics in agriculture and for those students to have an assignment that maybe can work for uh, their English credit as well. And so that's one way that we can, can integrate this project into some other classes. Um, the, so my class that I had at my previous school, it was a it was a global ag class, and so the the cornerstone final of it was the paper. Um, it wasn't to go to the Youth Institute; it wasn't mandatory. Uh, that was a choice of each of the students if they wanted to. And uh, <clears throat> now I actually am going to be doing it in my ninth grade A class at the school I'm at now. It just makes more sense because I see all of the students. So every student in the high school will experience the the World Food Prize process and then they'll get to choose if they want to actually go to a youth institute and, and do that personally on their own. <laughs> when I've done it, typically what we do is we spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the class just doing that researching. Like Jessica said, you just kind of pick a country. You, you, you don't know what you're going to find out, how interested you'll get in it. I don't I don't really believe that the two students I had that got all the way to the Global Youth Institute ever expected that country to be their most interested topic and now they're following what's going on forever with that, that specific country. Um, so that's kind of fun. But what we do is we do a short version first. So they research a country, they research an uh, issue, they come up with a brief solution, um, and then they present that to the entire class. And that's maybe, you know, two weeks after I introduce it. That gives the students an opportunity to hear other ideas uh, and it really spurs their interest. And then and we go back and they rethink what they're doing. So they either pick, stay with the same country and same topic or they adjust. Uh, I would say almost half of them have adjusted quite significantly too, because they hear something that interests them that they, they've got in their, 
rabbit hole of ideas and they didn't ever think about this other topic that another student was hitting. Um, and those topics might, you might say the role of women, well, the role of women in uh, one country might be very, very different issue that we discuss in the next country over. And so there are so many different angles to go and so many great stories to, to follow and then find solutions to. Um, and then we spend the rest of the class, um, not the, the entire course, but the rest of that semester working on these projects, working on these papers um, and, and getting them to a point where they're ready for review. And then we would, if they actually were something that we were going to submit to a youth institute, then we would get our English teacher to, to take a look at them and give it that extra level of, of review beyond what I'm able to do. So that's just a very short version of, of that. So then I, you know, all about the World Food Prize for my classes, we do watch that uh, documentary I posted about uh, freedom from famine. They actually watched part of it today at, during an e-learning day. So they were watching it today and uh, they will see that whole um, documentary. Then we'll talk about World Food Prize. Uh, and, and I really do push the internship opportunities first and foremost and say, as a high school student, you could be traveling abroad. Uh, that sparks some interest of some non-traditional students. Uh, and then we start talking about the paper and, and breaking down the assignment. So that's how we do it here. Um, so what else on the slide? Just, yep. Yeah, so we encourage those students to, to register. I help them with all that process. It's very simple. And then if they do go to the Institute, I typically will, will be the one that'll take them. Uh, and, and I do encourage other teachers to come with. By all means, the more we could spread this out, the better. So, uh, and then if they are selected, um, there's a, a small number from each state and I'm sure Mary might be able to give some of those numbers in the, what we've had for numbers in the past that get to go to the Global Youth Institute. Um, in the beginning years, it was a small number, it was about six students in the state that got to go when we were first growing this. Um, but those students then got to go down to the Youth Institute in October. That group of six students was pretty fun. And we will be sharing in our follow-up email with all of you the detailed plan of how the students can write these papers. So don't worry, it's not that hard of a process. It's just a little bit of work on the students' part because they're doing the research and the writing. So here's how you can support the students. Eric, if you could continue. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> yep, I, making Eric, a regular assignment. A um, that's probably the easiest thing. Yes. I, I just have a question when you talk about all the ninth graders doing it. Like I'm thinking about the ninth graders that I had first semester and I had about 40 of them, none of which are intrinsically motivated. So writing a paper um, would be like asking them to climb Mount Everest in 10 minutes. So like, do you legitimately get a paper from every kid? Like I, I am struggling to wrap my brain around how that actually plays out in the classroom. Thanks, Laura, you caught me. They don't write a three to five pager. They write a two page maximum. That's how we do it. So I don't okay. want to honestly read five pages from every single no, I don't either. ninth grader because let's be honest, the quality is not going to be there for some of them. So we do a maximum of a two page paper. And I tell them all that's for the assignment. If you know you want to do the World Food Prize, then let's extend it while we're working in this class, not after. Okay, that makes we're sense. We're not going to see each other after the semester. So okay, I'll, yeah, we'll work on it like that. So good question. Thanks, Laura. Um, other things. So they yep, select a mentor. That used to be a lot more specific of a role. I think it's more general now. I think, you know, as an ag teacher myself, I, I consider myself to mentor any of them. And then if they want to pick somebody that they want to take with to the Youth Institute, I by all means would suggest that they do that. Um, it was at one point, I think, a mentor per student. So it was like if you had 30 students, you had to have 30 different adults was kind of the mindset originally. But they've kind of let that go, I believe, now when a teacher can just take a group. And, and again, you guys can correct that in a little bit here, but but um, they just need to have that mentor that's kind of giving them that guidance and, and giving them suggestions of resources to look for, which by the way, the World Food Prize gives you tons of resources, so you don't have to come up with them yourself. Um, and then uh, from there, the packet that's online, um, we will send links to that packet. It's very straightforward. You'll see an infographic that goes through that step process. Of, of what you do and it is, it's everybody does the same outline of um, the organization of how they are gonna research their paper and it builds itself honestly into a three to five page paper pretty easily. Um, 
So uh, other things, mentor expected to attend the Youth Institute, I talked about that. So there's your timeline on the right-hand side of things. Um, so picking the country and starting to break out that outline and then working on your graphs, uh, multiple drafts for the ones that are really pushing for it. Uh, and then they, when they get that final paper done, that's their registration. So there is a registration deadline that you have to submit the paper by so it can be reviewed. Uh, and then there's the actual event. And so we'll get into those dates in a little bit here, uh, but just note that and, and you'll have to look on the website to you make sure you got the right deadline. You're not submitting on the day of the actual event. Um, what happens is, and I should explain this, those papers are read by reviewers um, both at the Minnesota Youth, Youth Institute level, and then if they do move on to the Global Youth Institute, with the intent of those reviewers helping students to improve their ideas. Um, that's what the, this is far more of a idea development and we're all in this, in this together kind of a process than a competitive type of a program. Uh, so anytime you attend a youth institute, whether it's a state youth institute or global, when you present your topic, Everybody else pitches and says, great idea, here's some other things that we could do to improve that, that situation in your country or whatever. And so uh, it's really fun when you're sitting, your student is sitting there giving their idea down in Iowa and a former uh, uh, World Food Prize laureate gives them a, you know, a tidbit like, hey, here's something we're doing in this country or man, I had never even thought of that. And it's such a, a inspiring moment for our students to feel that that feeling of camaraderie with somebody of that kind of stature and especially the scientific world, if not the political world or whoever it was um, that, that they spoke with. So, um, so they'll go to the Youth uh, Institute and then uh, at the end of uh, spring, early summer, the uh, group that's selected for the World Food Prize will be announced and then we prep them for heading down to uh, the World Food Prize in October. And World Food Prize Symposium is always in October. It is also always in Des Moines, Iowa, which for us Minnesotans is great because it's within driving distance. <laughs> so that cuts down on a lot of time. on. And our it's part, almost really always nice. during M MEA break. It's almost always during MEA break. Yeah. It's just a really fun weekend. If you do have a student that gets the chance to go, it is incredibly inspiring to meet these people that are not only global leaders, but also future global leaders in the form of students. Um, I was able to be on one of the roundtable discussion panels a couple years ago with students when we were able to have the event in person. And it brought me back to my own days as a student, but it also was just so inspiring to see this still continuing as much as it is. Um, and to see these students really driven to find these solutions, even if they're only talking about it for a little bit, some of them do continue on to have careers in this area of trying to better the world and hunger issues. So more for the teachers, we've got global guides. This is specifically for teachers and Eric is actually a global guide. So yeah, so this last year, um, I kind of was finally getting settled in at my new school this is my fifth year there and with COVID and all the other craziness of our lives, it's been a little bit of an adjustment. And so this is the first year I felt committed back into this uh, global agriculture, feeding the world, kind of a carry the baton again uh, mindset in this spring. I saw the application for Global Guides um, and, and talked to their administration and kind of explained why I was interested in it. And they, they gave me the green light to go ahead and uh, was lucky enough to be selected this summer. So I'll kind of explain as best I can what this is. It's not a, it's not a workshop. It's not a one week professional development. It's, it's a nine month commitment to uh, really investing in developing yourself as somebody who's gonna be involved in this global uh, education component of your the rest of your kind of career. Um, and I like that because it's not one of these one-off professional developments where you throw the folder in your desk when you get back and you forget about the worksheet idea that you got from the, the one one-off workshop. This is an all-in kind of thing. So um, maybe I'll just go through the slide first and then I'll kind of explain my experiences so far because we're about two-thirds through the Global Guides program right now. Um, so first of all, you get the, these are all free. You don't pay anything to be a part of it. This is just an estimated value of the, of the benefits that you, so you go to a lot um, symposium and this year was no person event except for the laureate, uh, past laureates, a few staffers and us teachers. Uh, it was 
and I don't believe it's going to be replicated again. I hope that the COVID world allows us to bring students back because I really felt like that was the biggest missing thing I've ever seen was not having students at the World Food Prize it was, it was a real uh, bummer. For us teachers, though, it was amazing because we spent the entire week with the laureates and you kept on sitting down with them and, and, and you know, Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack was there and you'd have lunch and then supper with him. I mean, it just wasn't a one time sit down. It was all week and it was just crazy uh, beyond anything I've experienced as far as the connections that we we're able to make. Um, and the really cool thing is you, uh, at least this year, our group got invited and it was the first time I believe the guys got invited to sit in the, the Capitol and be there for the laureate award ceremony. So we got to experience it in person. Um, so if you can imagine what it's like to go be there for the Nobel Peace Prize, this is the concept in the ag world. And, and to have said that I've been in that room when that happened is kind of an amazing experience that we had. And 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 you're standing around, they had a cocktail hour afterwards with all the laureates in the Capitol Rotunda for two hours. And you just walk around and eat hors d'oeuvres and chat with them about what their work is. It's just, it's a different thing altogether. So um, not guaranteeing that that's gonna always happen because once we're back in full person, there's a lot of people, those tickets are the hottest tickets in town. Uh, so I don't know that that'll always happen, but it, it could in the future. Um, the the next thing um everything's covered yep so travel funds for going down there so it didn't cost us a dime for that part um instructional support there's a ton more i think they value that at 150 but that's probably more like you know 500 to a thousand dollars worth of value if i was to pay for the type of professional development resources that i've gotten already and there's more to come yet this spring um the next thing is this this concept that they call it a conference but it really isn't um, it's the global learning and agriculture you hear this glag um, acronym all the time and it's starting up next week and it'll last most of this year so you get complimentary access to a ton of people uh, at the collegiate level at the secondary level in the united states and all over the world who are trying to teach about agricultural issues global food and hunger issues um, and it's just kind of an inspiring group of people with a, an incredible list of experiences that are going to start happening next week um, and they, they're on demand so you are going to be able to connect in and gain these experiences when it works for you uh, which is a really exciting advancement of that program so that's a, a free of charge opportunity uh, and then the biggest thing is number five there um, I'm not even going to touch the 10 hours of online instruction. You can imagine that's spending time with these folks that we're, we're talking about in number five. It's that group in number five that's incredible. Uh, I, should, I should have had my, my book here. Um, I mean, we have books that we are given to us by our, our writing about hunger-related issues. Um, and then the, that that author comes in the World Food Prize and spent two hours with us talking about his experiences in other countries. Uh, and then I chat with him afterwards and he gives me an extra copy for a student of mine that I, that I thought would be inspired by him. I mean, those, those are the kinds of priceless connections that you're gaining from these different individuals. Um, my group, there's 25 teachers. Um, I think there's about five egg teachers, but the rest, there's a school counselor in there. There's a music teacher. There's a fashion design professor from she's Georgia, I believe. Um, I mean, there's just a wide array of, of experiences and types of professionals in education that have this weird, goofy thing that I have that is this interest in global hunger issues, and yet they don't quite know how to fit in the mold. This is the mold. The global guide system is the mold. And so uh, it's been amazing to be able to sit down with a fashion design professor and teach and talk to her about how, how do you get fashion design students to be caring more about global issues? Well, there's plenty of ways, uh, and and we've been able to work with that throughout this process. So the other, my experience side of this is over the last six months now, five and a half months, we've been doing online meetings. Uh, I think probably five of those, each about an hour long, uh, where we discuss teaching of these these issues and topics to to bring back to our classes. Uh, we spent time at the World Food Prize together in person as a group. And then what we're focused on more than anything is a final product of some type. And we get to decide what that is. Uh, it could be a, a, a local project. It could be a global um, education curriculum piece that can be shared to other teachers. Um, but that's what we need to focus on right now. So as my example, um, it, it I don't even know how to explain how much bigger this got because of Global Guides. What we were doing before Global Guides is we were going to build a greenhouse and teach about plant science. In this greenhouse. Um, 
since then, through those connections, we actually ended up with a, uh, a, a grant app opportunity that we have applied for now, which is for $400,000 that we're getting from hopefully from USDA this summer. And we're going to actually be processing um, vegetables and fruits grown in Minnesota, in western part of Minnesota year round, as well as teaching meat processing and getting donated livestock from different farmers in our area. And all of the food is gonna be donated to our food shelves. I mean, that's that was not on my radar prior to Global Guides. Uh, and I would not have thought of it at all uh, had it not been for the, the people in charge of Global Guides knowing some connections and, and making some things happen. So um, it's gonna pay for itself in the volumes of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it didn't cost a dime to be a part of it. So I'm pretty pumped for, for this project to hopefully take off this summer. So. Uh, that's Global Guides. It's yeah. I, it used to be that World Food Prize was this amazing thing for students with a cool little, you know, egg teacher or teachers in general to get the chance to go to the, the World Food Prize. This is a whole nother level, uh, and this this is going to continue on hopefully for a long time. This also has some USDA funding support, but also World Food Prize Foundation support. So um, very hopeful that this will just continue to grow and, and provide opportunities for everybody. I had no idea about the food processing. That is incredible. And yeah, like you said, if you thought that this presentation was just about how to support your students, I hope you got out of it that it is to support you as well. <laughs> so Eric, why should we encourage students to participate? Um, like somebody pointed out, it's a big paper. It's a big undertaking for anybody involved. It sounds really intimidating, but why do we want to do it in the first place? I don't know if there's another activity and I, you know, being an ag teacher, I know the FFA world and the opportunities that FFA provides. There's not a, a more level playing field to me as far as an activity. This, this anybody can do. Yeah, you can get in, into this groove of I'm not good at writing a paper. Well, we can get you that. If you want to do something about some issue in the world and you want to have an opportunity to be a player in it, I, you don't have to jump through all the other hoops, meaning you don't have to graduate high school, go to a four-year college, start making the big connections, start off with some internships, then build your way up to a, a connection, maybe at some company, work your way through the ladder, and then maybe someday make an impact. You don't have to do any of that. This is the point at which you write a three to five page paper, and you could just from that experience be traveling across the world to do research, to, to work with scientists, to work with politicians, uh, if nothing else, at least to rub elbows with them for a couple of days down in Iowa. Um, if that sparks an interest of a kid, they're going to run with it. Uh, if it's not, you're not going to spark it in them. I'll be honest, <laughs> there, there's plenty of them that do it for the assignment and that's the end of it. Um, but there is a very specific clientele uh, and, and Jessica would be an example of that, that I think of, and I'm looking at some of the kids in the one picture, uh, one of which I see as an ag teacher now, and my students that have been down there, they have their own unique style, and, and it is a, we have problems in this world, but that's what we're here to do, is to fix those problems, and, and I'm going to start now, I'm not going to wait until somebody can. And that's the, the coolest part of it. So um, there's the other benefits, of course. And you can see, um, you know, it, it definitely covers plenty of the other core academics. Um, great opportunity for you to, to interact and gain communication skills. Um, but the real benefits are just those, those connections and long-term lifetime uh, changes in the way that you view the world and your ability to change the world. And so that's probably the, the selling point that I do. Uh, question about, I see, on, can this be done in an outside of school setting? By all means, there's no requirements that this is done um, within a school setting because this would be a click uh, um, link open for the description of how to do the paper and just run with it. If you have a 4-H leader that wants to be your leader, if you've got a community member, a Lions Club or a church group or whatever, find your mentor. It doesn't have to be a teacher. Um, I think the only thing is you just got to make sure you got somebody who can help you with the paper writing process. And from there, uh, the rest of it can be done totally outside of school. To jump on that, when I was student teaching, so I didn't even have my own classroom. I was almost done with my undergraduate degree. Um, and I was able to bring this program into someone else's classroom. And four of my students said that they would be interested. So we spent time after school working on this. Um, so me not even being a teacher at that point, I was still able to 
bring these kids into it. Two of them are in that group picture up top. The one in the yellow pants, I believe, is the one Erica was referring to. She's an agriculture teacher at, in Ashby now. Um, and she's been a rock star with World Food Prize programs, done multiple internships with them, stays very connected with that community. Um, but the other people in these pictures, I made a point of putting in pictures of students from Minnesota specifically, because these are all amazing people that have gone on to excel in their studies, excel in their careers, um, because they were able to start with that first step of being motivated by the inspiring people they were meeting that were not only older than them, but also the same age in them, and giving them that idea that they really can make a difference even as they're starting out in their career. Uh, I also love that this program supports public skill, public speaking skills, as I mess my words up, and interpersonal skills. Um, but we've said this a few times, it integrates all areas of study, not just agriculture. And like was mentioned, it doesn't just have to be done in a school environment. If you've got a couple of kids in your family or in your friend group that could be potentially someone that could really change the world someday, um, encourage them to do something like this and see what they'll do, see what they'll run with and do with it. Yes, Jessica, before you move off that slide, I just wanted to point out another person who is in that top photo um, to the very left is Priscilla Trin, who is a senior at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other benefits is that um, the Youth Institute really, this program gives youth a voice and um, and a forum to express their thoughts and, and ideas. And Priscilla actually got really, she continued like Jessica to be involved as a, a group leader at the World Food Prize and was actually this year selected. The, the board of, um, see, I think it's the, it's not the board of advisors, but the council of advisors. If you Google that to see who's on the council of advisors for the World Food Prize, Jimmy Carter's an honorary member. There's some other big names. They added two youth representatives and Priscilla is one along with a representative from um, the Netherlands. So that's one of the other things I think is really awesome is that the program makes an effort to really listen to the voices of youth. And, um, and then another resource I just wanted to throw in there is that the Minnesota Youth Institute has created uh, Minnesota Youth Institute ambassadors. So if you have a student who has questions, uh, we could connect them with another student who's been through the process more recently to be a resource for them. Throwing it back to Norman Borlaug for a second, one of my favorite stories about him is how he would be at the symposium. He, he died a few years ago, unfortunately, but um, he would be at the symposium and his staff would have to come and get him to come to his next speaking event or come to his next seminar that he was listening to because he would be stuck talk, talking with the students. Um, so he's the man that started all this with the World Food Prize. Students were incredibly important to him, youth in general, very important to him. And that spirit continues in the whole organization and in the spirit of the attendees of this, or, of this symposium to this day. Um, so these students are not just attending the institutes within their state or their country, um, but when they come to the Global Youth Institute, they're being recognized by those leaders as well. And like Maria said, sitting side by side with them, having lunch with them, having dinner with them, um, going to seminars with them and really getting to build those personal relationships with somebody that might be the prime minister of Tanzania. And then you meet his whole family at lunch the next day. <laughs> Speaking right. from experience, she says. Just a little bit. Um, 2022 Youth Institutes in Minnesota. Mary, take it away, please. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the Youth Institute opportunities have expanded in Minnesota. Uh, this will be the 15th year of the Minnesota Youth Institute in the Twin Cities. There is also, um, you'll see here on the list, Rochester. This is their third year of off offering an institute. And that one is really focused around the medical industry. It's not that students have to write a paper about that, but students who go there will have the opportunity because it is Rochester and connected to Mayo, uh, a focus in that area. Um, Crookston has the Northern Great Plains and they invite students from North Dakota. I don't know if they've had any Canadians, but they I think would be welcome if they wanted to and Northwestern Minnesota or anyone else from across the state. Um, of course, the one in the Twin Cities and in the West Central Youth Institute, their first one will be this year. Uh, Jessica has included the dates of the events and I would just wanted to emphasize those are the dates of the events. 
not the registration, which Eric had mentioned earlier. Registration is about a month ahead of the event so that we get the papers and are able to review the papers. Um, and the information about the dates is on the website. Also, the students don't have to wait to register for the register registration deadline if they register early. Um, we will follow up with them to provide resources, answer questions. So if you have students that are thinking about it, they can register. There's a registration form and a paper submission form. So you don't have to wait um, to submit the paper and register. Again, it's open to students grades mm -hmm. 9 through 12. Um, the link um, that we have shared here is the Minnesota Youth Institute link. And I'll also drop the link to the World Food Prize website that includes more information about all four of the institutes in the state. And I'm happy to answer any questions and also connect you with the other uh, coordinators. Mary, I have a quick question. You may have just answered it as I was thinking about my question. So I have listed on the Minnesota Ag in the Classroom page about the Youth Institute, the um, Institute on May 16th and the paper due date as April 11th. So each of these other youth institutes have their own separate website with the um, registration link or how, how does that part work? You know, what, what I would encourage you to do is this link I'm gonna put in here right now is the link for, um, for the World Food Prizes page for youth institutes in the state of Minnesota. Uh, the, each one of them has a sub page on the Global Youth Institute website. We have a more built out page. Okay. I think this is the best page to share with everybody so they can see all four options that are available in Minnesota. I will make that update to our page too then. Cool, thank you. Thank, for, you. thank you for clarifying. Yep, no and making worries. sure it was caught as well. Jody asked, does everyone who submits a paper um, in Minnesota have the ability to go to one of the institutes within Minnesota? And the answer is yes. Um, to go to the institutes in Minnesota, it is not a competition. That is purely, let's get those kids together. Let's get those mentors together. Let's bring all those ideas together. Meet the leaders that we can bring into that same space so everybody can talk and share um, on those dates. And then from that pool, some are selected to be able to go on to Iowa. So Minnesota is not selective. Going to the Global Youth Institute is. All right. And um, even before the registration dates, even before the paper writing, again, bring those lessons into your classroom from Ag in the Classroom. Bring those resources in. We don't just have the lesson plans. We also have other resources listed within our curriculum matrix. And it's a great way to just jumpstart that conversation and also get your own ideas going as you're developing your curriculum around this and what order you want your lessons to be in that makes the most sense to you and your students. You can find resources and learn more at each of the websites. We will be sharing the slideshow, so don't worry about having to write all these down quick. You can also take a screenshot, of course. Um, but for Minnesota Agriculture in the Classroom, Youth Institutes in Minnesota, and if you would like to elevate yourself a bit and be a global guide, obviously that's an excellent program for anybody that would like to do that as well. So with that, we do have a few minutes for questions. We covered a lot of material about a few different things you can do with your students in a very short amount of time. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question, please. I see one about what is the cost of going to the event? Correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, but I think all of this is free. Yeah, there's no cost to participate, only to get to and from the event itself. And that's to Minnesota? Uh, to uh, um, to whether you want to go to Crookston, Morris, or uh, Rochester, the Twin Cities. There's no cost for any of, uh, of the four of them. Has anyone else in the group had a student participate in any of this? Or maybe one of your own children or a friend's? Mm -hmm. Sarah, I think you were mentioning your daughter's done some of this before. What's your experience been? Yeah, so my oldest daughter did participate in this um, two years ago. Um, so didn't quite get the full experience because of course, um, in the meantime, we, um, the pandemic happened. And so she got a lot of virtual experiences, but um, 
was really able to grow her her network and find some positive uh, mentors and learn a whole lot about uh, the need for food in she focused on Japan and connections with beef being we are beef ranchers here and was kind of her area of expertise um, to start with and be able to dig in on that so um, a very positive experience um, and she enjoyed it a lot. Um, I'm hoping maybe both of my kids are now in the uh, 9 through 12 age bracket that maybe they'll choose to participate um, again in the future. Uh, but definitely something that I, I would encourage people to do. And I mean, as you saw from Jessica's comments, it's a great way to be able to bring in some of those other subject areas and get them to see a little bit broader picture about agriculture and how we're all intertwined, not just here in Minnesota or the U.S., but globally. Um, and through all of my journeys in, in agriculture and FFA, uh, that was the one time that I always knew I still needed to have a really strong relationship with my English teacher because that was not my area of expertise. Um, but just a great way to, uh, to have those conversations and, and develop some of those skills as well. And I, I'm not going to lie, when I was a high school student myself, I loved if I could write an agriculture paper and get my English teacher to give me credit for it. So... I just want to add on to what Sarah said. Uh, a lot of the students who participate in the Minnesota Youth Institute have come from the suburbs, not as many from greater Minnesota or from the urban Minneapolis, St. Paul area. But one of the things that's been really cool to see is that they have an appreciation for agriculture that they didn't before. They make the connection between agriculture and the environment and food. And I think for the students from greater Minnesota, sometimes they have a greater appreciation that agriculture is connected to the environment and food. And, and so for everyone involved, I think it opens, um, broadens the perspectives. We had one question about if this is an individual program or team-based, and that is individual. So each student that would like to submit a paper for one of the institutes in Minnesota would be submitting their own paper. And that is the three to five page. It's not just the two page, sorry. <laughs> but really, once you get into the research, it flies and you start to have a little bit too many ideas sometimes um, to cram into your paper. So it can be a pretty fun project. I'm curious if anyone in the group's been listening, you've come up with some ideas. How are you thinking about incorporating either lessons about food insecurity, um, global awareness, any of these other topics, how are you thinking this might work in my classroom and maybe that'll spark something in someone else? Ethan, I'm gonna pick on you because I know you. You mentioned the grand challenge. Can you talk a little bit about what you've done with that or what you're going to do with that? Yes, sorry. Um, we are, uh, it's state degrees are due tomorrow. So I have students, we're working on state degrees. Um, but uh, for our grand challenge course, um, it's for our juniors and seniors that have taken some, they've either taken our uh, intro to animal science class or intro to plant science class. And kind of the goal is to take the information they've learned in those classes and kind of look at the global problem of food hunger and uh, find some local solutions. And we're gonna try to focus on things a little bit more sustainable than just holding like a food drive, but figuring out whether we could do some sort of raised garden beds in the community or if we could partner with some local organizations and provide um, some opportunities to advance what they're already doing. Or um, I'm gonna challenge my students to even write some grants to see if we can create some sorts of our own programming. And so the, the idea is for students to really get beyond just the, oh, here's what you have to learn and focus more on the problem solving, critical thinking, um, is kind of the route we're going. And so I'm, uh, we're going to be starting that course for next school year. And I am 
currently looking for curriculum ideas. And I know Mary and I talked about this a while ago. And so when I saw this event, I'm like, yes, this is some curriculum I'm, I'm thinking about adding. And so very helpful stuff. And I think um, one way uh, my students can see that, you know, we're not the only ones trying to work on this problem. This is, this is something that folks are investing in and there's careers available here and um, hopefully we can make some, some local difference. And so pretty excited for that. If you have other curriculum ideas, I am always all ears. Um, feel free to shoot me those in the email. We'd love to connect with anyone working on similar initiatives. Any other ideas sparked out there or something you're really excited to bring back to your students while we've been talking? Jessica, this is Carrie. I'm not, you know, a teacher, but I have an idea for you for next summer. I think your summer teacher tour could be all based around this project with this global food security I topic and find some really awesome industry folks that are working in this field to meet with or go and see. So that's what it sparked for me today, that this could be an entire teacher tour day full of learning about this topic. Definitely. And thanks for the plug for teacher tours as well. Um, teachers, that is something that you can be involved in for kind of an amusingly low cost um, through Minnesota Ag in the Classroom. It's up to about $50. So if you ask your district for that money, they'll probably say here really quickly. Um, it's either a half day or a full day for most of them. Three out of the four are in person, so far planned to be. And one of them is planned to be virtual at this point, um, just by nature of how we're planning them. And it's some time for you to take some time with other teachers and learn about agriculture in Minnesota learn about some companies, learn about some farmers, maybe visit some kitchens and restaurants, um, learn about food, natural resources, and how it all ties together directly in our own state. You can find out more information about those at the Ag in the Classroom, Minnesota Ag in the Classroom website. Any other connections that we're thinking of? Any other ideas to toss out or questions you have? All right, so go ahead and screenshot this. Again, we will also be sending this out um, via email just to follow up with the slideshow attached as well as a few other things we've talked about throughout the day today. Um, we've got our contact information here with all our emails and phone numbers. Thank you everybody for attending. It's been wonderful to have you with your questions in the chat and over audio. So thank you all very much.